Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Chloe Hill, and I am the EGU's Policy Officer. I am very excited to welcome you all here today to the session on scientists, science, politics, European disintegration, um, a conversation of geoscientists with Ilaria Kapwa and Maria Monti. On stage today, we also have the EGU President, Alberto Montanari, and Vice President, Jonathan Bamba. During the session today, both of our esteemed guests are going to give keynote presentations, which will then be followed by questions from you, the audience. This topic is, this topic, I'm sure, is very close to many geoscientists' hearts, and I have no doubt the questions will prompt some really insightful discussion between our guests today. But now, to give an official welcome and a proper introduction, I would like to welcome the EGU President, Alberto Montanari. Thank you. Well, first of all, I must say that I'm very pleased to see a so large audience today. This is what we consider an innovative event for EGU, and it's a great pleasure to see that there is an interest uh, by the community in what we are discussing today. As you know, EGU is launching uh, in uh, this year, in 2019, a program group in its uh, General Assembly that is called Science and Society. The aim is to strengthen, to reinforce the dialogue on, uh, between the scientific community and policy makers uh, and political institutions. You know, we are mainly researchers, students, uh, and uh, also educators here. And a relevant question for all of us is uh, to what extent and in what way should scientists and educators be involved in making public policy decisions. If, uh, on the one hand, scientists refuse to get involved into politics, uh, then modern society runs the risk uh, to take heel-based policy decisions. On the other hand, if scientists get too involved into politics, they run the risk of being not understood, being put under pressure, and may be accused of compromising scientific integrity. So, I mean, it, it's a, a difficult balance. We could say that the boundary between science and politics that exists today in modern society is based on uh, the political theory that go back to Machiavelli, Rousseau, and early natural philosophers like, uh, including Galileo. Clearly, it is founded on centuries of thought. However, today we are challenged by an unprecedented setting. What we are experiencing today is new to humanity. I am emphasizing this, and uh, I hope that you, uh, you don't think that I'm too emphasizing. I really think that this context is new. Despite communication being very easy today, so we have unprecedented opportunities to communicate, the risk of misconception and fake news has never been so high as well. So it's a contradictory setting. EGU wants to be proactive. We are positive. We believe that our era offers exciting opportunities to science and society, provided scientists are able to speak with politicians with an innovative approach that we would like to contribute to create. It's not easy. But to give a contribution, today we are hosting a conversation between the community, between you, and uh, Professor Ilaria Capua and uh, President Mario Monti. They are excellent researchers, and uh, on the other hand, they, are, they have uh, an excellent experience in politics. So I think uh, they are the ideal persons with whom we should start talking with them. Ilaria will be introduced later by Jonathan Bamber. I'm uh, now introducing uh, uh, the figure of uh, Mario Monti. He was Prime Minister of Italy from 2011 to 2013. He served uh, as a European Commissioner from 1995 to 2004 with responsibility for the internal market, services, customs, taxation, and competition. 
Mario has been recently the chair of the ERC search committee for the incoming ERC president. He has been rector and is currently president of Bocconi University in Milan. And he is currently a lifetime member of the Italian Senate. The way we are organizing the conversation today is to give the word to Mario first and then Ilaria for two subsequent presentations. And then we will take a quite large amount of time to open a debate from the, with the audience and then we will accept what we hope will be numerous questions from you. With that, I am pleased to give the floor to President Mario Monti. Mario, please. Thank you very much, Alberto. Actually, I wish to thank uh, both presidents and all of you. It's uh, a great honor and pleasure for Ilaria and me to take the floor in front of this, uh, let me see, not completely empty uh, room. Um, Alberto introduced uh, somewhat why we are here. Let me say just a, a few more words on uh, uh, where we come from and why we wish to engage you, the European geoscientists, well, not just Europeans, but mostly Europeans in a dialogue. Between Ilaria and I, both Ilaria and I, had the opportunity to become acquainted with uh, both spaces in the title uh, of this session, science and politics. Ilaria is, of course, a life scientist, a virologist. I am, used to be, a social scientist, an economist. We became engaged in different moments of our lives in politics, uh, both of us at the national level, Ilaria is a member of the Italian Parliament and vice chair of the Cultural Committee of the Italian Parliament, myself as prime minister, and in my case also at the supranational level, being uh, a European commissioner for 10 years. Now, why are we so interested in the dialogue with uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, the geoscientists? Because to both of us, maybe we are naive or superficial, but geosciences represent, in many respects, in our perception of you, the glue between diverse areas that correspond to our planet and beyond. And because glue is glue, perhaps similar strategies can be explored to solidify loosening relationships to glue member states of, for example, the European Union uh, together. Um, why we are also so interested in uh, integration? Well, since the beginning of this millennium, I would say, um, Globally, not just in Europe, integration, that is the coming together of, of various nation states, can be seen as uh, retreating. Uh, that is uh, visible at the global level with uh, less and less multilateralism. That is visible in some countries which are increasingly tempted to break up among regional components. And that is, of course, mostly visible in the place, in the place in the world, which has made of integration the, the key word to advance in history, that is the European Union. Uh, we believe that there has been an enormously virtuous circle at work in uh, European Union uh, after World War II. The virtuous circle between integration and democracy. The original six member states of the EU, then various uh, new 
uh, arrivals into this uh, human adventure. Um, you know, I remember once at a meeting, Shimon Peres uh, being asked, uh, who was, Mr. President, in your view, the greatest uh, of all uh, uh, French uh, political personalities? He reflected a moment and he said, not Napoleon, not the goal, Jean Monnet, because he invented the concept of integration and put it at work how much we would need a Jean Monnet in the Middle East. Sometimes we are shy about our enterprise, the European integration. Many others envy it to us. At any rate, it has been a virtuous circle uh, bringing through the magnet of integration, bringing uh, into the process countries that uh, found also in that the strength to abandon dictatorships and enter democracies. Let me just mention Greece, Spain, Portugal, then the countries in the former Soviet bloc. This virtuous circle was triggered by visionary leadership, which more recently has tended to be almost everywhere political followership of daily or instant public opinion polls. Long-term vision more and more turning into short-termism in political calculations. The pursuit of the common good more and more giving room to the personal or party interests. And closer and closer to your space, competence, giving more and more away to the rejection of competence. Evidence-based enlightening of action, more and more replaced by fake news and fake history, I would call it, which is a systemic collection of fake news to reconstruct histories quite apart from reality. And finally, of course, from traditional media to the social media. So now, with uh, these uh, new values, or these retreats in old values uh, at work, we are seeing a combination of populism, nationalism, sovereignism, and protectionism, which are having impact, uh, let me oversimplify, in the US, globally, in the European Union, and within individual countries. Well, within individual countries, I mentioned already the case of Spain, uh, the case of the so far United Kingdom, which in the process of finding its own exact place relative to the European Union, I hope stays a United Kingdom, but that is open for question. But let's limit ourselves mainly to the US and to the EU. Well, in the US, the game of populism and nationalism, which has played very vividly in one statement, America first, by the way, in Europe, many of our self-promoted nationalistic leaders are tempted to replace America with the name of their own country. But President Trump did not, did not say Michigan first or Florida first. He said America first. Um, of course, nobody puts really into question the, the, the integration of the 50 states into the United States. They do not, they may want bigger government, smaller government, but uh, not really put into question the existence of a unitary United States. Yet, out of Washington, populism and nationalism emanate a huge transformational factor, the rejection of multilateralism, of coordinated governance of globalization in favor of whatever is bilateral, if not unilateral. 
And of course, other big powers in the world are ready to reciprocate that more down to business, so the pragmatist uh, would believe way of governing. In, uh, and so uh, at the global level, we are seeing uh, a shift from multilateralism, uh, which probably saw its high days uh, a few years ago with, uh, uh, with President Obama. Um, and now, in some way, we are led to believe that, and maybe it is the case, that uh, the new leadership of open uh, globalism is uh, President Xi Jinping, then it's not always uh, easy to read what is behind that. And in Europe, well, in Europe, it is the European Union which is in question, which is uh, the identity and unity of our um, home that is in uh, question. Um, I would not rule out that we may witness an undoing of the formerly virtuous circle into a potentially vicious circle where uh, the, the, the forces at play, followership, short-termism, uh, personal interest, rejection of competence, fake news, fake history, the social media, may bring to less democracies, perhaps towards authoritarian or um, slightly more demagogic uh, organizations of power at the national level, of course, these uh, mentalities in national governments, governance are less uh, susceptible to embrace with enthusiasm integration. And integration, if it uh, becomes weaker and weaker, may uh, dilute the glue, your stuff, uh, for, uh, for uh, and leading, therefore, to less democracy in individual member states. Well, can I just point to two historic examples of visionary leadership versus followership in the extreme? Well, Chancellor Kohl, the architect of German unity and of uh, much of uh, European uh, unification in 1998, was challenged in the election for chancellor for, for the parliament by Gerhard Schroeder. German citizens did not want to leave their beloved Deutsche Mark in favor of the untouchable, mysteriously uh, to be created Euro. Gerhard Schroeder rode on this horse. Uh, um, Chancellor Kohl stood on his uh, activity saying that Germany would be dangerous to itself and the rest of Europe if a unified Germany were to, have to be also the only country in Europe with a strong currency. So he wanted monetary, uh, monetary union in Europe. He lost the elections, he lost power, but of course he ascended into history as one big father of European integration because the single currency was there after a short while. Much as I liked David Cameron as a man, we were colleagues on the European Council for a while, I must say his decision to call a referendum on British membership of the EU can hardly be justified with, uh, let alone the European interest, but the national interest of the UK, not even the party interest of a strong unitary conservative party, but historians begin to say with the interest of strengthening his rather precarious grip on the vociferously divided conservative party. Just look at the consequences on that for himself, for the UK, for uh, Europe. So uh, this is uh, really the, the plate that we have in front of us with so many 
possible evolutions from a model which gave us peace, prosperity with the big but of the financial crisis and the economic crisis. It would be all too easy to absolve competence and economic competence in particular, forgetting the tragic parenthesis of the crisis and of the victims of the crisis. But nevertheless, we do not see in place remedial action proportionate to that situation. We see rather a drift towards less and less rationality. And my concluding word, ladies and gentlemen, before I pass the baton to uh, Ilaria, is uh, the next victim. The next victim, I'm afraid, is going to be you, that is science. Because there was upon a time, once upon a time, and there still is a very virtuous cycle between Euro European integration and science. I had an opportunity to touch that, to measure that, to see the people around that when I was tasked to chair the selection committee for the new ERC president. At any rate, you know that from your daily experience how much the European Union contributes to empowering uh, research in, uh, in uh, uh, Europe and to strengthen the global impact of European scientists. I am sure that through her personal, extremely interesting experience, Ilaria will now plunge us all into this, but my concluding word is you are the stakeholders of European integration. Don't forget that the status of the work you do, the multiplier in terms of impact and of application and of global resonance of the great work you do, each of you, has a lot to do with the persistence, the going ahead, or the moving backwards of European integration. So please mobilize for that. This is not a political call. This is just an identity call. This is not party politics. This is the way of being for those of us who want to serve Europe and who see each of us as also benefiting from Europe. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much, President Monty, for that, uh, if you like, call to arms and overview of the threats and risks from European disintegration. Um, to sort of keep the mood in the room a little bit positive, I'd really, um, really prefer um, if we didn't have too many questions about Brexit. In fact, I'd rather prefer we had no questions about Brexit, but I leave that to you. Um, so I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Ilaria Capura is a virologist best known for her research on influenza viruses and her efforts in promoting open access to genetic information on emerging viruses. In fact, she's done a lot of work on promoting open access more generally. She's been a member of the Italian Parliament from 2013 to 2016 and is uh, a quite a high profile victim of uh, fake news, which um, she will tell you much more about. She's currently a full professor at the University of Florida in Gainesville in the US and director of the University of Florida One Health Center of Excellence. So please welcome on stage, Ilaria Capua. Hello, hello, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm one of you guys. <laughs> I am, and of course, um, 
the presentation wasn't working and, um, and the video wasn't right. And you know what it's like, right? You know what it's like, okay. So is it okay if I move here and talk to you and like be friends and tell you a little bit about my experience? And, um, and also remind you that, that we are scientists and we love science, and, and we live in a very complex environment. And it's really hard times for us just now, um, but, but we have to remember what, what we have in our heart, and we have to remember why we, why we are all here, because we love science. Okay, so now you got the easy part, and now you're gonna get the funny part, which is not so funny. Um, this is a painting by Caravaggio, and do you know who this guy is? Yes. There's lots of narcissists in the room. Yes. And this talk is all going to be about me. So this is like the greatest narcissist talk that you've ever listened to. And I've done it so you can do it too. Okay? We're free. We can tell the world that we are narcissists. Because we are a little bit. And you know what? It's okay to be a narcissist. Okay, so your favorite narcissist is gonna give you two perspectives today. The first perspective is that of a, of a young girl who um, wanted to be a scientist. And, and to be a scientist, I ended up in vet school because I had another objective that was I wanted to leave home and the only uh, offer that combined both uh, doing, being able to do science and going away from home was going to vet school. And so I'm a veterinarian by training. But I knew I was never going to do anything with an animal and I actually immediately started working in a lab. And this is, I think, one of the first pictures that were taken. Um, when I was just looking um, at that window and thinking about how I was going to um, maybe have access to some European funds. It was many years ago. The second perspective is the perspective of Ilaria, is a perspective of a scientist, but it's a perspective of a person, of a person who has a story to tell and who wants to share that story with you. Okay, so the scientist. Here's the, here's the good part of this talk, okay? Here's the scientist. The scientist in Italia, eh? <laughs> Okay, uh, no, 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 brava. Just to, to show that there's, you know, a bit of a difference between how science works in Italia and how it works in Sweden, in Germany. It's, it's another world, right? Okay, in Italia, so in Italia, okay, we have lots of things, but we have lots of parties, and, and, and we have lots of fun, and, and I'm sure that all of you had similar experiences in, in, in your labs. I started very young, and I started with a very small group. And the group grew, and we had weddings, and people got married and went somewhere else. And the group, it grew, it grew, it grew. And it grew to the point that we did work that was, that was really interesting. And I didn't do that work by myself. I did that work with these people. I did that work with motivated young men and women who really wanted to do a good job in science. And, and, and you know how we got there? How did we get from that young 23-year-old um, who wanted to do science to become a group that, was, that the New York Times was talking about? How did we do it? We did it with European funds. That's how we do it. That's how we did it. We started off with cost actions that are actually now also coming back. It's like vintage um, cost actions that would fund only travel. And then all the framework programs. And, and they got bigger and bigger. And we got stronger and stronger as scientists. And what does European research do? It creates teams. It creates fantastic teams of people who work together in the same place or in another place, or in another place in Europe, or in another place in the world. And you can do this. This is what European research does. 
It brings together an immense strength, love and passion that we have in Europe for science and it brings diversity. And this is what is empowered by our European research programs. When I see this slide, I cry. This is our network in my previous lab, in my previous job when I was a scientist. This is the amount of people that we trained on influenza viruses, doesn't matter. It was rabies as well, it was Newcastle as well, doesn't matter. Thank you for this moment of silence. Isabel Mingitz Tudela was a, was a scientific officer in DG Research. Um, she died um, a few years ago. And uh, she is one of the heroes of European research. And there are many, 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 many people like her. And that is why I like to remember her. Because there are a lot of people in Brussels that are instrumental, that are useful, that understand our priorities, and that are able to create the critical mass of European scientists. And we should never forget that scientists is not, that European science is not only about us, but it's also about them who empower us and help us and guide us to be competitive. She was a Mediterranean woman who was able to fight for priorities in the field of animal health and of plant health and of the, at the intersection between human health and animal health. And she did an enormous amount of work. And unfortunately, she's not here with us anymore. But if, you, if I, I don't want my clap, I want to clap for her. Can you please do it? Thank you. Okay, one of the few things that, one of the last things that Isabel said to me was, you need to go into politics because you can make a difference. And so this man sitting here um, and who spoke just before me so eloquently phoned me up one day and I didn't even know him and he said, would you be willing to run for election as, as a member of parliament? And I said, how much time do I have? And he said, 24 hours. And, and so, you know, you know there, when is this going to happen again? You know, you have your stories, you have your stuff you want to say. And so I said, why not? And I was elected in parliament and I, I spent um, three and a half years as a member of parliament. But there I discovered um, some things that I hadn't ever thought of. Um, I discovered what populism is. I, I, I discovered what post-truth is, and I understood how post-truth, populism, and science are completely incompatible, simply because populism is the framework that divides between the corrupt and, and the elite, the, the corrupt and the, and the good people. Um, post-truth, instead, is what pulls your guts more than your brain, and so, your decisions or opinions are, are more linked to your emotions and not to facts. And we know that science doesn't work like this. Science works in a different way. It doesn't provide black and white answers. And we make mistakes. We make mistakes all the time because science makes, is error prone. And it relies on competence. Another thing I discovered when I was as a, a member of parliament, I discovered that there is an industry out there ready to make noise, ready to make noise about whatever they dislike. And this industry is, is, has a very, very clear objective, and the objective is to change opinions and to make money. And we cannot pretend that this is not happening because what happens is that you get all sorts of news that are considered as trustworthy news, and then you start getting the Novax movements um, that are extremely dangerous. 
um, because there are generations now of children that are not vaccinated. Um, when it, oops, when it gets to this, where they start evoking fascism, or where, for example, in, the, in New York, there's an outbreak of measles that they cannot keep under control. Just now, 2019, just now. This goes against our passion and it goes against our love and what we fight for. Another very soft issue is animal experimentation. We have to go through animal experiments. We don't like to do animal experiments, but unfortunately they're necessary. And we need to explain this. We need to explain it to people who protest, who loot laboratories, loot. They let animals free. And we need to protest against extremists that do not allow us to do the experiments the way that we should. But news can be misleading. Um, I am un unaware of you about how many know that it, the EU is sitting on another time bomb which is beyond disintegration and it is African swine fever. African swine fever is a devastating disease of pigs which is widespread in Central Europe and sooner or later it's going to become a problem and there's no vaccine for it. But as soon as this becomes a problem, look at what you find on the web. The African Swine Fever University that actually states that African swine fever can infect human beings. And this is not true. It is false. African swine fever is a disease of pigs. Full stop. The management of diseases of plants can be influenced by misleading news. We have a very serious problem in Italy just now, in the south of Italy, with an infection with Xylella, but this is no exception. In the United States, citrus greening has destroyed 80% of the citrus industry, 80%. And here I come to the final part of my talk. At times, <clears throat> fake news can become surreal, surreal. After not even a year that I was elected as a member of parliament, I discovered that I um, was charged um, for crimes, a series of crimes. Basically, according to them, I was an international virus trafficker. Um, and for the crimes that I had committed, I actually risked life imprisonment. Okay? So this is no joke. Um, I was, um, a, I, I discovered that my phone was tapped um, when I was advocating for data sharing, when I was being praised by the New York Times and by the other organizations about how brave we had been to share and to fight for open access in a moment of crisis, I discovered that my phone was tapped and that the people listening had misunderstood some conversations. And therefore, a dossier was prepared. And in this dossier, I was accused of being um, an international virus trafficker and actually of having deliberately caused epidemics to make money and to sell um, a vaccine for which I had a patent. Just so to remind you, a lot of the anti-science movements, they base their um, ideas on conspiracy theories. And um, the conspiracy theory is there, it can be adapted to whatever you are doing um, in, in this competence is completely devalued and bizarre theories that have nothing to do with the truth can emerge. So as a virologist, I can tell you that I am very, very concerned of the next threat that is going to become viral. And this threat is the fake news threat for science. Science 
scientists and institutions are under attack. And I know that this very big union includes climate scientists, and I know that you have been under the radar, on the radar screen for a long time. And this is what populist movements do and will continue to do to science. The biggest risk that we have is that our personal and institutional credibility, remember this word, credibility, is shaken. And I believe that every component of society should take its part of responsibility in fighting the devaluation of competence, particularly of scientific competence. And the reason for this is that we have these like little challenges that are coming up um, that scientists are gonna have to answer. They are gonna have to give their opinion. They are going to have to talk to the policymakers. Look at just a few of the recent covers of The Economist. We cannot lose our credibility. We cannot. We must not. And so this is about us, okay? This is about us as scientists. We have to continue to defend EU research and its core values. We are here and we have contributed to science because from Italia and from Denmark and from Greece and from Germany and from Hungary, we were all brought together under one umbrella of European research. We need to prepare because attacks will come and we need to develop strategies to maintain our credibility. And we need to find new ways to engage with the public. The old ways where we are the ones who inform the public, it's finished, it's done. We need to engage. And as I walked into the building this morning, this is what I saw, and I would like to commend whoever had this idea of bringing artists in residence to um, this conference and to the society, because this is one of the ways that we will be able to engage with the public. Okay, now it's Ilaria talking to you, and I promise that I'm finished. And the reason why Ilaria is talking to you as a mature scientist or a former scientist is that this story can become your story of loneliness, of public shame, and of despair. The real reason that I am here is because I have a mission B in life. And my mission B is to advocate for you, because this is about you, it's about us. I have been a victim of fake news. I have experienced the violence of slander and the despair of reputational loss, despair. I am concerned, I am afraid that what happened to me can happen to other people and that institutions will be shaken apart from people and families and groups and research groups. And my real mission B is that I advocate for scientific integrity of when scientists are accused of committing crimes or of misconduct. Because this is really about us. It's about our lives, it's about our careers, it's about our institutions. I would like to leave you with one video that holds all of this together and would like to invite you that no, to think about the fact that nobody is going to do this for us. 
nobody, it's our problem. What do I have to do? Ah, sorry. This is a video from the Wellcome Trust. We come from different places, from different cultures and backgrounds. Science brings us together. Together, we mix logic with intuition. Together, we push the boundaries of what's possible. Together, we can solve vast problems, and microscopic ones, too. Together, we save lives. But divided, we can't. More than ever, science needs us to join together. Together, science can. So thank you, thank you, and thank you to <laughs> President Montanari. <laughs> thank you. But... <laughs> I am not finished oh. <laughs> because I would really like to thank Professor uh, Montanari for putting this together. Thank you, Professor Monti, for having introduced um, the concept of how important it is that we stick together. And thank you all for being here and thank EGU for this wonderful meeting. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, I must say, uh, Ilari and Mario, that I am really impressed. I think the messages that are coming out today from uh, your contribution are uh, manifold and extremely exciting. And uh, I think really we are gaining today um, a clear indication that we need to take action. We need to move forward. But now, I would like to open the conversation, and uh, I'm sure that uh, the audience is, uh, has uh, questions uh, to, uh, to ask uh, the presenters, uh, and therefore, please uh, take the mic. Uh, and uh, I saw one question, yeah? Go to the mic. In introduce yourself, Gunther. I'm Gunther Blöschel from Austria, a hydrologist and former EGU president. I was quite impressed how closely the messages of the two presentations were aligned, really closely related. And I would ask, in terms of integration, what can we as average researchers do to foster integration in our daily work? To Professor Monti. Okay, or um, before we go to questions, actually, I'll, I'll get a couple more questions just so we can be as efficient as possible. So if you have a question, please just line up behind the microphone. Okay. I'll, I'll let you go to that one now while we're waiting for people to get to the microphone. Well, what can we individually do, you can do as researchers in your daily lives to foster integration? I believe in particular European integration. It's very simple. Be yourself and tell surrounding people who you are and how the you relates to you, and uh, uh, what uh, aspects in your activity, as was the case for uh, Ilaria's initial uh, stages of her activity as a scientist, would not be there, or would not be there so productively, on so, or so inspirationally, if the EU had not, there, uh, had not been there, if the EU would be uh, undermined. You see, 
I am, of course, a fervent supporter of uh, European integration for a high number of reasons. I will not bother you about them. But I believe that we are rather short of very persuasive, touchable and visible arguments to support the case for integration today. And the big advantage of populists and nationalists is that they can in five seconds on TV say, I would close frontiers to foreign goods because our productions are, uh, uh, I mean, because we, we aren't competitive enough. It would take two minutes to uh, undo that reasoning and to explain why, after all, uh, if one takes into consideration the possible reactions, the long-term effects, uh, closing frontiers is not a good solution. So most arguments in favor of integration are awkward to present. But the results of science and the fact that uh, the EU uh, is doing a lot for science, not only in terms of financing scientific research, and innovation, but also in terms of allowing the creation of network, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is a very visible value added of Europe, and uh, uh, that's why um, I believe it is very important to promote uh, Europe with the, the positives that uh, Europe achieves. And thanks to the army of European scientists. Uh, the scientific advancements of Europe are one of the main products of European integration. So as, as you can see, I leave aside the more uh, spiritual, moral, long-term political uh, and subjective arguments, but this is an objective fact that I'm sure you can be a powerful vector of. So we have two questions in the front microphone and one in the back. So I'll take the two in the front first and then you. Good morning, President Monti. Good morning uh, to everyone, uh, Honorable Capua. My name is Raffaele Persico. I'm a researcher of the National Research Council. And I would like to put um, your attention uh, on uh, another aspect. Uh, I apologize if my glance is uh, sectorial and not so large as, uh, of course, uh, uh, your glance is and has to be, being you uh, politicians, important politicians. But uh, this is an audience of geoscientists, so uh, you will not be surprised if some question regarding more specifically geoscience can arise. Um, uh, one uh, further problems for also regarding sciences, not only geosciences, integrations uh, between scientists and, and so on, is also, in my opinion, the fact that sometimes even the political decision or some decision that should be political is indeed taken by, not by the politicians, but by uh, the administrative guys, guys. Some important the bureaucratic apparatus sometimes uh, takes a decision that should be taken at a political level. I will do a small example, but not so small. Yes, In Italy, so actually, I might just, we're short on time. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Uh, one I, minute. I, I one minute. I'm, I'm, uh, I will be only one minute. Okay. If possible, otherwise I have finished. <laughs> That's no problem. I think, I, I think, no, no, okay, okay. Uh, In Italy, uh, we have, uh, they have published a document recently uh, from the National uh, Direction of Archaeology, Circolare Numero 4, Circular Number 4, <laughs> uh, yes, that regards the uh, investigation, non-invasive investigation, in all the ar Italian archaeological sites. Nowadays, it is relatively easy to do an investigation in an archaeological site in Italy in the sense that if the person excavating of that site is interested, he, she can ask you for some prospecting with geophysical instruments, with drones from SAR, whatever. With this document, 
many uh, things will be centralized. I will cut a, a short, a long story, but now, but I invite you to um, put attention yeah. on that. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, so, Claudia. So, my name is Claudia Jesus Rudin. I'm a program officer at the European Research Council, the ERC, and I love democracy. However, I have a feeling that democracy has one big fault, which is you miss mechanisms to protect democracy against extremism and populism because they just arise and they are a big threat to democracy. So of course, there are the European elections coming up and that should be a good opportunity for all of us to uh, use our rights and our duties to in democracy, but I would also like to take, have your take on how can democracy protect itself from the threats of populism and extremism. Okay, good question. And at the back. Yes, uh, my name is Dimitris Kutsoyanis. I also love uh, uh, European integration as well as democracy. And uh, uh, may I also uh, and that uh, democracy uh, needs uh, a high level of education and particularly uh, uh, upper uh, education in uh, universities. It is closely rel related to uh, democracy. Uh, but my question is, is different. Uh, I believe it is very easy to blame populism uh, without actually uh, arguments because it's uh, obvious, but uh, in order for populism to, to flourish, there should be some failure. So uh, I, my question is, what, are, what was the cause that caused this failure? And if you don't have the causes, how can you um, think that uh, just fighting populism, things would change? Okay, thank you. Okay, so Mario, would you like to go first? Yes, quickly, because uh, I believe Ilaria has a tax to pay on all this as well, in terms of answers. Um, well, the two, the two themes uh, fall nicely together. How can democracy protect itself from populism? And uh, uh, is it reasonable to fight populism without addressing the causes that brought to populism? Uh, in my view, now here I used uh, this uh, word populism as a shortcut uh, to many negatives, but uh, um, in, in, in uh, more, uh, I mean, in deeper debates, I tend to use the less used word sovereignism. Uh, populism per se is a good thing. Who, who might wish? Uh, uh, something uh, not to come from the people. Uh, on top of that, those political movements which call themselves populists are proud to be populists, and rightly so. Uh, also, in most cases, they point to really existing problems. I happen to believe that in 98% of the cases, they come to wrong or impracticable or counterproductive solutions. Uh, for example, um, the um, uh, globalization has um, created uh, uh, huge inequalities uh, in income and wealth. Who could deny that? Of course, upon a further looking at the topic, one sees that that is particularly the case within societies of uh, the most advanced countries because in itself as to the distribution across countries in the world globalization has drastically reduced the disparities but it is true that it has been a process which has taken out of us bourgeoisie of uh, formerly the only industrialized country a portion of our rent. We were exploiting the third world, which has been now triggered by technology and information into the economic uh, play. 
but it is true that uh, in uh, Western societies, huge inequalities domestically have accompanied the globalization. Uh, then the populist answer would be, again, close frontiers, go back to the nice old days of isolationalism. I don't believe that would be feasible, but I am totally in favor. I have acted concretely on this line for years in Europe and in Italy for a profound reform of the taxation systems so that it becomes more progressive, that it also uh, uh, takes something from wealth and not just from uh, income and acts a redistribution on uh, that. So um, uh, I, I, I totally agree, we don't have time to go deeper into that, that uh, Populistic uh, thesis cannot be rebutted just by saying that they are populistic positions. But it is true that in most cases, uh, populistic proposals do not hit problems at, at the, uh, the root. How can democracy protect itself from populism? Uh, I would say becoming, first of all, real democracy. I do not believe that uh, the behavior of most politicians in uh, democratic societies today is genuine, transparent, putting the interest of the common good ahead of the personal interest of being re-elected. So the best, uh, the best uh, uh, f uh, way of feeding populism is practicing bad democracy. Um, and, and so there are many other ways in which democracy should uh, um, strengthen itself through more virtuous um, uh, behavior. And of course, good education is of the essence because otherwise uh, electors will not make a, a, a a, a use of their electoral power which may correspond to the political system delivering what they really care for. Ilaria. Um, I mean, I, I could speak five and a half hours and I don't think that anybody is so interested in my views. Um, Okay, what I can say is there are two general points that I would like to make. First of all, that as scientists, we deal with complex issues, and therefore things are more and more complex as we understand them, because now we have more data that we can interpret and we can feed into our models or um, studies. And um, the, the, the populist movements, um, they, they are not geared towards addressing this level of complexity. Um, I do think that um, one of the things that certainly I am doing in my center is to uh, propose um, novel areas of intersection between different disciplines. Um, in a way that we can provide new solutions to um, mistakes. We have made mistakes, okay, lots. Not like us singularly, but as a community, because that's what the science was telling us at, at the time. And so, um, taking ownership for those mistakes and realizing that there should be um, uh, th there are other ways. And the final thing I would like to say is that, uh, you know, I would really like to see a science pride movement. Science is important, and as Mario Monti said, and others have said, we are the real stakeholders of the European integration. We are the people who get the most benefit in our careers and our professional life. And so it's our problem. Sorry, but. Okay, so we do have time for just one more very, very quick question. Yeah, um, and everyone else, we do have an exciting announcement at the end of this session that's related to this session. So um, yeah, make sure you stay for that as well. 
My name is Max Frederick from the Swiss Water Research Institute. Um, we have been praising democracy and the European Union in this um, debate so far. However, looking at global warming, I think the European Union has been failing so far to address this problem at the speed and in the way it would be necessary. So would you like to comment on this? Thank you very much. Okay, so I get this. I'm the lucky one who gets this question. <laughs> I live in the United States. <laughs> that is my answer. And that is why I am concerned. And that is why I talk about credibility of scientists being shaken. So I am not a climate scientist. I um, in agreement with you, I would be happy to discuss this with you. I understand exactly where you're coming from, and I live in the United States. And some words cannot be mentioned. Okay, so you're, you can only complain a little bit. <laughs> um, I live in the EU, <laughs> specifically in Italy. I am often very critical about the EU and its uh, shortcomings in uh, delivering policies. Uh, I believe that uh, in the area of the fight against climate change, uh, the EU has been among the big parts of the world, certainly the first one to take political action. Uh, all of you know more than I do about the substance of this problem, but I seem to remember that uh, since the Kyoto days, uh, in terms of mobilizing uh, international energies to address this problem, which was not yet called by us common mortals fight against climate change, the EU was in the forefront. And then uh, gradually, uh, and with great uh, political commitment, it, became to, it came to convince uh, the US uh, and then together uh, China. Now, of course, there is movement backwards. But uh, uh, not only that, in terms of beginning of a delivery, um, for example, if one believes, uh, as I to some extent do believe, that uh, the taxation instrument can be helpful as one uh, instrument uh, to address uh, climate change, uh, I believe that uh, the European Union, as uh, an uh, orderly aggregate of countries, has at least uh, the scale and the institutions in order to be able potentially to introduce the CO2 tax or whatever other system you might uh, prefer. Because, of course, if individual countries were to go down that road, each of them would have to face the objection that they would lose competitiveness. The EU can, let's say, internalize that uh, uh, objection. But and here we see the potential, but also the limitation of acting through the EU. But there, is, uh, there aren't uh, many areas in which uh, the EU uh, really does need uh, the consensus of each member state. One of these areas where, which are submitted to the veto power of member states is taxation. And of course, therefore, also CO2 taxation. So that if one believes that... Uh, uh, in order to fight climate change, one instrument is taxation, then the EU has the right scale. But unfortunately, its institutional and legal arrangement is outdated relative to the needs of the modern globalized world. And so one should fight um, if one believes that, first of all, there is climate change. Second of all, it is man-made. I wouldn't touch this delicate uh, topic here. Uh, and third of all, that there are some fiscal policy instruments to be used uh, alongside with others, then one should advocate a change in the treaty which would allow 
tax decisions not to depend on unanimity of member states. So you see how nicely together we are able to cover the uh, continuum of problems from, from eternity and immensity to the nitty gritty of the functioning of the EU, economically, politically, and legally. So thank you for that question. So I'll just hand the microphone over to Alberto for a final few comments. So, as I anticipated before, I think uh, this has been a very stimulating uh, debate. And uh, I think that we all agree that scientific association, important scientific association at the European scale like EGU should uh, take an action. So, on suggestion of, uh, by Mario and Ilaria, EGU decided and Council approved to issue a statement which summarizes the outcome from the discussion today. The statement is going to be published just now. It's titled, The European Geosciences Union supports, as you can see, a united Europe for the benefit of global scientific research. I would like to quote verbatim from the last sentence. EGU is committed to standing up for international cooperation in science and taking a leading role within the scientific community in order to reduce barriers to scientific collaboration and cooperation across Europe, let alone increase them, as this would be a tremendous loss to European nations, to the international scientific community, and to humanity as a whole. We think this is a way, a small brick, to build our future as stakeholders. And I think that an action that we may take is to give it visibility and brainstorm to put other bricks in order to build our future. With that, I'm really pleased to thank uh, Ilari and Mario. I, I think, uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, we are really honored that you are here. And I think that you made a significant contribution. I'm really convinced that this has been innovative and delivering a powerful message. Thank you very much, and thank you to all of you for staying with us, for bearing with us, uh, even if we were running a bit late. Uh, it's really exciting and stimulating to see a so motivated audience. Thanks a lot.